Thank you for coming to the next session, uh, radiation protection in ion beam and the targeted alpha therapy. Uh, recently, we have several different uh, type of therapeutic procedures, such as uh, uh, targeted radio uh, nuclide therapy or uh, carbon ion therapy uh, or uh, others. So. Uh, we need to have uh, uh, methodology or something to have this uh, practical uh, clinical usage of such kind of treatment method. So we have four distinguished uh, speakers here today, and then uh, we are uh, chairing this session. My name is Tatsuya Higashi of uh, QST Chiba, and good morning. My name is uh, Mahesh. Uh, I'm a diagnostic medical physicist and a professor at Dan Shopping, Johns Hopkins University School of Medicine. My colleagues uh, are currently doing work on radiopharmaceutical therapy in the, they are having some alpha uh, uh, therapy clinical trials. And I'm also a member of the ICRP Committee 3. And this, is, this, this session is very important in terms of the radiation protection in medicine for all the upcoming. So I'm very much looking forward to, and we will co-chair the session. Uh, we kindly request the speakers to be within time, and then we'll have more time for question and answer. And during the question and answer, I would I kindly request anyone asking question to be very direct, precise, and short, so that we'll have more time for answers. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Mahesh. Okay, uh, let me start the uh, first speaker, the presentation. The first one is the titled as Development of, of Clinical Application of uh, Targeted Alpha Therapy Using Astatin AT211. So, Dr. Tadashi Watabe from Osaka University. So, please, uh, Dr. Watabe. Uh, thank you very much for your kind introduction, uh, Dr. Uh, Higashi. So today I'd like to uh, talk about the uh, development and clinical application of target alpha therapy using astatin. So first of all, I'd like to introduce the concept of serenostics and uh, target alpha therapy. So serenostics or radio serenostics is a combination word of uh, diagnostics and therapeutics. So in the uh, serenostics, uh, we First, perform diagnostic imaging to uh, confirm the target expression uh, in the uh, tumor in oncology patient. Um, and uh, also, we can estimate the uh, absorbed dose in uh, tumors and also in the uh, organ at risk with high physiological accumulation. So in this figure, uh, the patient is uh, advanced stage uh, cancer, uh, patient with uh, prostate cancer, and uh, uh, the images are ta targeted uh, with uh, PSMA, prostate uh, membrane, uh, specific membrane antigen. So you can see the same distribution uh, in PET image and also in the uh, therapeutic uh, compound image. So uh, we can perform this serenostics uh, uh, technique uh, in uh, one flow like this. And uh, the, I'd like to explain about targeted alpha therapy uh, with uh, actinine PSMA. So now uh, targeted alpha therapy TAT uh, is getting uh, big attention. Uh, because uh, the, uh, in 2016, the University Hospital Heidelberg Group reported uh, that uh, uh, in prostate cancer patient uh, with advanced stage, uh, this patient showed progression with uh, uh, beta therapy using rotation PSMA, but patient uh, showed complete remission after three doses of actinine PSMA therapy. So uh, that alpha therapy is very effective even in a uh, refractory patient uh, with uh, beta therapy. Uh, but actinim has uh, some uh, issue for the uh, global supply because its production is still limited uh, 
in the world. So we are focusing on uh, astaching. Uh, it's, it is an uh, alpha emitter with relatively short half-life of 7.2 hours. Uh, but advantage of this uh, astaching is we can produce uh, this using uh, uh, accelerator with natural bismuth target. So it means uh, we don't need any special radioactive material. And if we can set a cyclotron uh, base in, uh, in a country, um, we can uh, perform domestic uh, production of this alpha emitter. And, and the decay of such is very simple. So uh, it emits alpha ray. And this daughter nuclide polonium 211, it also emits X-ray, so we can image the uh, distribution in a patient. And uh, astatin is uh, the located in the just below iodine in the periodic table, so it behaves similar to iodine. So we are uh, we thought uh, that it will be effective in the uh, refractory patient uh, to iodine treatment. So uh, in this metastatic thyroid cancer, uh, you can see the uh, multiple lung metastasis in the iodine treatment image. But this patient showed uh, progression why uh, in the second uh, treatment, uh, you can see the increase of tumor size of lung metastasis, and also you can see new metastatic region. So in this kind of patient, we need more strong uh, radionuclide therapy. So this is a comparison table between iodine-131 and astatin. So uh, uh, astatin is the alpha emitter, so higher therapeutic effect uh, is expected. But in addition, uh, in iodine-131 treatment, we need to keep the patient in a, a dedicated room because we need to uh, protect uh, the uh, radiation exposure uh, from the patient to public or caregivers. But in astatin therapy, uh, we don't have to keep the patient in uh, uh, dedicated rooms. So I will talk about this point uh, later. So oh, uh, I'd like to show you the uh, biological effect of uh, uh, in the comparison of uh, astatin and iodine. So. Oh, uh, in the upper figure of astatin 211, you can see more strong uh, DNA double strand break signal uh, compared to the iodine. Even the dose uh, radioactivity is the, uh, one uh, tenth of the uh, iodine dose. And uh, this is a figure of uh, general after model of thyroid cancer. And you can see the high uptake in the tumor uh, like this. And, uh, and for the therapeutic effect, uh, the, you can see that this is control. Uh, you can see the dose-dependent treatment effect, uh, what 0 0.1, 0 0.4, and 1 megabaker administration. And when we compared this effect with iodine, so this is control, and this to uh, uh, iodine uh, administration. And astatin administration showed uh, tumor shrinkage effect for a long time. So uh, it is uh, really uh, effective in the treatment of uh, thyroid cancer in the preclinical setting. And now we, uh, we are running uh, this phase one clinical trial in Osaka University uh, for refractory thyroid cancer patient to iodine treatment. So in this clinical trial, we uh, perform a single intravenous administration of sodium acetate and uh, evaluating the uh, safety, uh, efficacy, uh, and also pharmacokinetics and absorbed dose. And so far, we uh, injected uh, sodium acetate to seven patients uh, at this moment. So this is those escalation study. So we are increasing the dose in this phase one study. And in Japan, there are several uh, sites with uh, uh, accelerators which can produce astatin. 
So in Osaka University, uh, we have this AV cyclotron, so we can produce uh, astatin in the uh, Osaka University campus. Uh, so we can get uh, get uh, direct supply uh, from the, the uh, this uh, accelerator facility. But in addition, we uh, we have other uh, facilities uh, in uh, Japan, uh, Riken, uh, QST, or Fukushima. So uh, we can also get the uh, supply from other facilities in the form of uh, irradiated bismuth targets. So uh, there are several methods uh, for uh, the, uh, to get the supply of astatin. And for the uh, regulation of radio pharmaceuticals, uh, several rules are related uh, to for the uh, use of radio pharmaceutical uh, in Japan. And uh, in the hospital, uh, Medical Care Act is uh, uh, res mainly responsible for the handling of radio pharmaceuticals. And uh, for beta therapy using iodine and lutetium, uh, we, we have to keep the patient in a uh, dedicated room. Uh, but for uh, alpha therapy, uh, we don't uh, uh, have to keep the uh, patient in such uh, dedicated room. So that, uh, uh, so in the uh, research group of Ministry of Health, uh, Labor, Welfare, uh, led by uh, Professor uh, uh, Makoto Hosono of Kinda University, so, and uh, I uh, made an uh, uh, estimation of uh, effective uh, dosing publics and caregivers. So uh, in this scenario, uh, we assumed the patient uh, stay in a, a one meter distance uh, for uh, six hours, uh, 12 hours for caregivers and six hours for uh, general publics uh, in uh, one day. Uh, then the uh, estimated effect of is like this. So we consider the uh, external radiation exposure and uh, also uh, internal exposure. But uh, the uh, estimated dose is far below the uh, upper limit of uh, the recommendation by ICRP and IAEA. So then uh, we can perform uh, the treatment uh, or clinical trial using sodium acetate uh, in an outpatient setting or uh, using uh, the uh, normal hospital room. So uh, uh, when we compare uh, the astatin with actinium, uh, so it is a relatively short half-life. But another advantage uh, is uh, uh, capability of imaging. So we can calculate uh, the absorbed dosing uh, organs and uh, in uh, tumors. And in, in a clinical trial uh, using sodium acetate, we uh, scan the patient at one hour, uh, three hour, and 24 hours post injection. So actually, this is not astatin image. This is different PET image. Uh, and uh, we calculate the uh, uh, activity in each organ and uh, uh, calculate the residence time. Then uh, we put uh, these values in a, uh, uh, IDAC uh, dose uh, software, and then we can obtain the uh, absorbed dose in each organ. So uh, uh, now the clinical trial is still ongoing, so I cannot disclose the results at this uh, moment, but uh, this is uh, uh, estimated absorbed dose in human from the biodistribution in mice. Uh, so in mice, uh, you can see the uh, high uh, physiological accumulation in the thyroid, uh, similar to iodine, and also oh, you can see high accumulation in the stomach and stomach contents, because stomach also express uh, sodium iodine simporter. And as a result, uh, you can see the high uh, absorbed dose in thyroid, uh, followed by the uh, stomach. So these are uh, considered to be the organ at risk in 
uh, 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 such in therapy for thyroid cancer. And we uh, also developed uh, uh, imaging uh, software uh, uh, so with the collaboration of uh, Dr. Tatsuhiko Sato, fourth speaker of this session. So he used RT fits uh, to uh, generate the individual uh, absorbed dose map. Uh, uh, this is a uh, equi-effective uh, dose map. Uh, which is generated from the uh, patient's CT uh, and SPECT. So uh, by using this uh, technique, we can visualize uh, uh, absorbed dose in uh, organs, uh, normal organs, and also in tumors. And we are also thinking of uh, next clinical trial using astatin labeled PSMA for refractory prostate cancer so this compound shows very good accumulation in a uh, prostate cancer general model uh, like this. And it also showed very good uh, treatment effect. So we uh, are now in the final preparation stage of this uh, clinical trial. And hopefully, we can start uh, the clinical trial uh, using Astatin PSMA next year. And we are also expanding the uh, production capacity of astatin because uh, uh, we, in the uh, routine clinical practice, we need uh, the huge amount of astatin. So we are now constructing a new building with a dedicated cyclotron for the production of astatin in Osaka University. So maybe um, in two years, we can uh, achieve a, a large number of uh, large-scale production of astatin for the uh, multiple-site uh, clinical trial. So in conclusion, a physician-initiated clinical trial of sodium astide for refractory thyroid cancer has been conducted with dose escalation in Osaka University. Patient can be released immediately after administration of astatin due to minimum uh, radiation exposure to publics and caregivers. Imaging capability of astatin will be beneficial to estimate the absorbed dosing organ at risk. So finally, I'd like to thank my uh, collaborators and thank you very much for your kind attention. Thank you very much, Dr. Watabe. So now the uh, session is open for discussion. Okay, only one question we have, we're gonna have, please. Um, thank you very much for the presentation. It was very interesting. I'm Rita Blue from Finland. Um, from radius and protection point of view, I would like to ask you that have you considered also uh, waste issues and patient excreta? Uh, because uh, you mentioned that this is uh, good because it can be used uh, for outpatients. So how about... Uh, if the patient goes home and vomits, for example? Yes, so uh, the sodium acid is excreted in a urine, mainly excreted in a urine, so we need to uh, care about uh, the, that excretion, the waste uh, of, from the patient. Uh, but uh, the half-life of astatin is 7.2 hours, so uh, we don't... Uh, have to think about the uh, radiation uh, for the waste for a long time. Uh, but uh, the, usually the uh, waste from the patient is, uh, should be uh, disposed to the, uh, the toilet. And then the, uh, it was uh, diluted in a, a, a natural uh, environment. So then the, uh, the uh, uh, even in the reabsorption to uh, publics, it, uh, it's, it shows no uh, significant problem uh, in the dose calculation. Okay. Okay, thank you so much. Uh, we have to go to the next speaker. I'm sorry, I forgot to uh, show <laughs> I'm sorry. Dr. Zhang for the introduction of the laboratory. So 
first one. We have the Yonai, Dr. Yonai, the second, and you are the first one. I'm sorry. <laughs> okay, let's start the uh, second presentation uh, of uh, by uh, Yonai, Shunsuke Yonai, and the uh, uh, title is a contribution of QST to radiation protection in ion beam radiotherapy after publication of ICRP 1287. So please, Dr. Yonai. Thank you for your introduction. I'm Shinsuke Onai from QST Japan. Now, today I will talk about uh, radiation protection in ion beam radiotherapy. Now, ion beam radiotherapy, including proton radiotherapy and carbon radiotherapy, has the uh, advantage that uh, physical properties that, uh, of charged particles, such as black peak, allow for high dose concentration on the target volume and reduce the dose to surrounding normal tissues uh, with even small fraction uh, compared to photon radiotherapy. Uh, the ICRP published ICRP publication 127 in 2014, which summarizes and makes recommendations on radiation protection issues in IBRT. The, the generation safety management for the IBRT facility and preventing accidental exposure of uh, patients from IBRT as well as uh, three categories of uh, exposure. And now, uh, 2000, 2023, IBRT is still one of the most remarkable treatment modalities for uh, mainly for solid tumors and about 40 IBRT facilities are currently under construction around the world. And the number of the, the IBRT facility in operation has doubled about uh, 14 facilities and the cumulative number of patients has nearly tripled since 2014, according to the uh, PTCO website. Now, what has changed from 2014 in IBRT? A uh, major change is a significant increase in the number of irradiation system using the scanning beam method uh, instead of the broad beam method, especially in CIRT. Uh, this figure shows the CIRT facilities in the world. Uh, in 2014, uh, the number of uh, CIRT facilities in clinical operation is seven. Uh, of which uh, only three facilities uh, used the scanning beam method. But now, uh, uh, 16 facilities, CR2 facilities is in, in operation, of which 14 facilities are using the scanning beam method. Now, what is the difference uh, between the two, two beam method? Uh, the broad beam Broad beam method uh, needs many radiation devices, as shown here. Uh, so the primary beam can interact with these devices and much secondary radiation is produced. In particular, uh, 70 to 90% of the, the primary beam is, is stopped in, in collimators uh, that is set close to, to the patient. So, so these secondary uh, radiations co cause the uh, patient dose. Uh, on the other hand, the uh, scanning beam method doesn't, doesn't uh, need uh, these irradiation devices. So in theory, the scanning beam method can increase uh, beam efficiency, uh, resulting in advantages for radiation protection, such as less secondary neutrons production and less activation in the, in the irradiation devices. Uh, in 2014, uh, there was little data on CRT uh, using the scanning beam method, so there was little discussion of this issue in ICRP 127. Uh, in this situation, uh, we QST ha uh, have uh, continuously investiga investigated radiation protection uh, in IBRT, mainly in uh, carbon ion radiotherapy. And uh, uh, the, in this slide, our research activities are list listed. In, in this presentation, I will talk about uh, issues related to medical exposure to patients 
uh, documentary on secondary neutrons and the assessment of atom filters in CIRT. At first, about the symmetry on secondary neutrons in CRT with scanning beam method, now we evaluated the neutron ambient dose equivalent per treatment dose at patient position by measurement using, uh, using Wendy 2, uh, which has uh, extended high energy response beyond 20 MeV. The beam parameters were set the same as these uh, studies for comparison. Uh, these studies uh, uh, evaluated the neutron dose for, for, in, for carbon beam with the broad beam method, and uh, this, this study uh, measures uh, neutron dose for proton beam with the scanning beam method. Uh, from here, I will show you some results. And, uh, in this figure, and, uh, the comparison between a comparison of the neutron dose between uh, carbon beam with uh, uh, with uh, broad beam method and uh, scanning beam method. As you can see that uh, uh, neutron dose in scanning beam beam was less than ten percent of that in broad beam. And also, uh, the difference was larger as the position, position became uh, further from beam axis. Uh, this is because uh, internal neutrons, uh, which are produced in, inside body, uh, contribute to, to the patient, uh, the dose, uh, regardless of the uh, beam delivery method. And uh, uh, this figure shows a comparison of the neutron dose between uh, for uh, uh, proton beam and uh, carbon beam. Uh, neutron dose in CRT was about 60% of that in proton radiotherapy. Uh, in our previous study for broad beam method, neutron doses in proton radiotherapy were more than two times higher than in CIRT, so uh, these results are consistent. And so here now I have to I have to mention the the difference in angular dependency of of neutron dose between between uh, in CIRT and the proton radiotherapy. Uh, in this figure, the, the red, red line shows the uh, result for proton beam, and uh, this uh, this do dose uh, uh, does not depend on the, the the emission angle. On the other hand, the carbon beam has an angular dependency. Uh, um, this reason can be can be explained from this figure. Uh, this figure shows a neutron spectrum at the, at each angle for carbon beam. Uh, you can see the there there is a difference at the high energy peak. Uh, this this peak is made made by uh, projectile neutrons from incident carbon ions. So now. Uh, projectile neutrons uh, is produced strongly in, in the forward direction, so this this uh, difference causes uh, causes uh, angular dependency of the neutron dose in CRT. And in addition, we evaluate the neutron dose in multi ion radiotherapy. Now, IBRT using multi ion beams has the potential to offer improved local tumor control for hypoxic and or radio-resistant tumors by optimize, optimizing the distribution of both dose and radiation quality at the same time. At QST, much um, radio therapy has been investigated using helium, carbon, oxygen, and neon. And uh, we will start uh, much um, radio therapy soon, probably in, the, in, in this year. And then, uh, uh, this slide shows a uh, neutron dose uh, for, for much ion beams. Uh, you can see that the neutron dose pass the treatment dose during these ion beam irradiations are less than that of proton beam irradiation. 
the heavier ion of a, of a less neutron dose per, per treatment dose. And, and I, uh, here I, I, I'd like to move on to the out, out of field dose. Uh, in axial photon radiotherapy, the main source of out of field dose is the primary uh, photon beam, such as P patient scatter, collimator scatter, and leakage radiation. On the other hand, in CRT, the main source is not the, the primary carbon beam itself, but uh, secondary charged particles and uh, uh, secondary neutrons. Uh, now in this presentation, I will talk, uh, I will show you our uh, two results. Uh, one is for prostate cancer treatment, and another is for uh, pediatric brain tumor uh, treatment. Uh, both, both investigation was done with, with uh, by uh, Monte Carlo simulation with with, with uh, Fitz code and uh, computational phantoms. Uh, in, uh, in brain tumor treatment, for comparison with adult and uh, calculations with ICLP reference quantum were done for, for the same beam setting as that uh, with a uh, pediatric quantum. Now, actually, we have to change uh, the uh, beam energy uh, because, uh, because the body size uh, are different between, between adult and uh, uh, pediatric Phantoms, but uh, for comparison, we, for comparison, uh, in this study uh, we did we did not change the the beam energy. Uh, this is a result for uh, prostate cancer treatment. Uh, in this figure, uh, uh, the uh, result for carbon ion CIRT result compared with photon radiotherapy. Now, this, this line is uh, for CRT with broad beam method, and uh, here is the uh, result for CRT with scanning beam method. Now, uh, you can see that uh, the uh, out of field dose in CRT is less than uh, that in IMRT, and, and in this region, uh, the dose in CRT is less than brachys that in brachytherapy. And uh, at this slide shows the uh, result for, for uh, brain tumor treatment. And uh, here, in this figure, the, the dose in CRT uh, compared with uh, IMRT result. Now, now, the dose uh, in CRT with broad beam method uh, is 0 0.1 millisievert per gray RB to 1 millisievert per, one millisievert per gray RBE. And uh, when we use the, uh, uh, sorry, and, uh, the scanning beam method uh, further reduce the uh, dose uh, by, by uh, an additional order of magnitude. Anyway, the out of field dose in CRT is typically one to two orders of magnitude lower than that in IMRT. And uh, uh, we, we compare the pediatric and adult, adult results. Now, the dose depends only on the distance from the target, regardless of the age. Of age. And so pediatric patients are prone to receive out of field dose due to their small body. Uh, however, a neutron production strongly depends on the, se the beam energy, and, uh, and a small body should lead to less neutron production by primary beam. For example, uh, this uh, blue point uh, represents the result for, for uh, prostate, prostate cancer treatment and showing in the previous slide. And uh, in this treatment, uh, 400 MBB per nucleon carbon beam wa was used. On the other hand, here, uh, 
in the lithium treatment, 290 mb per nucleon carbon beam was used. Now, you can see uh, lower, lower carbon beam uh, offers uh, uh, less, uh, less out of field dose. Uh, photon beam does not have this benefit because the out of field dose in photon therapy is due to to, to scattered and uh, leakage primary photons. And the inclusion and uh, QST, such activity on radiation protection in IBRT after the publication of ICRP 127 were presented with the focus on medical exposure to patient in CIRT. In, in, instead of broad beam method, the scanning beam method have been installed in CRT facility as well as proton radiotherapy facilities, which is an advantage for radiation protection. So, so I can say that the conclusions and the recommendations presented in ICRP 127 are still valid today. Thank you for your kind of attention. Thank you for your wonderful presentation, Dr. Inai. So, discussion is now open here. So, the next one will be slight change in the order. We want to welcome Wai Xing Chang. Oh, thank you, Dr. Yeah. Wai Xing Chang from Tokyo Metropolitan University, Japan and she is going to report on the poster. Um, Hello, uh, my name is Wei Shan Zhang. I'm very uh, happy to have this chance to introduce the summary of contributed posters and pre-recorded videos for this session, the radiation protection in Anbing and target of therapy. So let's take an overview for this session that we have seven presentation in this session and four are from Asia, including Japan, China, and Taiwan. And also we have three from Europe, two from Spain, and one from France. And related the topics of the presentation, we can see there are five top, uh, five presentation it are about particle therapy and one is, uh, uh, about radio nuclei therapy, and somehow one is uh, in related to interventional radiology. Mm. Uh, because I think that uh, the poster at the venue are should be introduced with a priority. So the first three uh, inter uh, presentation are oh you can. Oh, see the poster in the next room after this session. And the first uh, presentation is related to the nuclear radiotherapy. Mr. Mihai, Yuma Mihai and his colleague research, uh, investigated the applicability of simplified alpha spectroscopy to radionuclided periodic test on production floors of alpha emitting nuclei radionuclide. So in general, the alpha spectroscopy, when we use that, it is, uh, we have to use it with a vacuum chamber to prevent uh, the, to, to let alpha particle can reach the detector because alpha particles are very easily to attenuate. But to maintain the vacuum costs a lot of money, so the this group, they uh, try to investigate it, the applicability of uh, the uh, simplified alpha spectrum scopy to measure radionuclei pure reality with, without a vacuum chamber. So uh, what they do is they like trying to apply an uh, aluminum collimator on it. And at the beginning, they do this research using a Monte Carlo simulation code fit. And here, you can see the right here, the figure here is their uh, results, their simulation results. And the left one, of course, is the one without any collimator, and the right one is the 
uh, load detector with the collimator, we can see that the results that the, the uh, applying of the collimator really improve the results. And after that, they do a real measurement to evaluate the method of detecting radium containing actium sol uh, solution as a radioactive purity. And this small figure here is the, the result that we can see that it shows a good uh, agreement with the calculation result. And in the future, they are going to have uh, more purity purity, uh, purity test on other radionuclide. So the second uh, presentation is from Yuan Jilong. The, the title is Stray Radiation Dose Measurement in the Proton Therapy Room in Pencil Beam Scanning Mode, which we, are also, we, we also have some talk uh, from Dr. Yonai before, and the purpose of this research is to investigate the relationship between those by radiation and the distance for scanning beam by using a windy 2 detector and a 401p one ionization chamber servimeter. The setup is just like the figure here, upper, upper figure picture here. And uh, this is the result here that we can see that for both gamma ray and the neutron, they decrease uh, the they, the dose decrease with, uh, with increasing distance to isocenter. And also, they found that the generation of stray radio radiation is related to uh, the cum exit window, nozzle shell, and the shallow surface of the protective wall in the room. The third presentation is uh, related about interventional radiology. The title is The Study of Radiation Protection in the Integration of Transcatheter Cardiovascular Imaging Transesophageal Echocardiography. <laughs> so uh, the purpose of this uh, presentation is to investigate the feasibility of convenience radiation protection shield for TSTEE using optional uh, using OSLDs. And the result is showing on this picture that the green one is uh, the, the control without any shielding, and the pink is the result for uh, with shield. And they found that the evaluated target were <laughs> Uh, the exposure for the evaluated target decreased to 50% to 20% of that without shielding. And so the following presentation are, uh, you can see that online. So Ms. Evangelina Le and her colleague investigated uh, the, the avian dose equivalent in the treatment room of uh, proton therapy synchrotron bus facility, uh, which is a little bit similar with the second <coughs> presentation, but they use different geometry and the de detector. In this uh, uh, research, the, the purpose is to measure the avian dose equivalent by the neutron gamma rays using LV6419 detector containing a cylindrical moderated RAM counter uh, with uh, Helium proportional counter and the plastic scintillator. And uh, the result was showing here. And based on these results, they also make some like scenario for their medical worker, worker to see like in which in different situation how they are like explored. And the, a bad scenario they gave for an example was that a worker remains in a high perfection long treatment session in which 50 gray, 15 gray is delivered the total dose. The worker will receive at the P4. P4 is like between the gantry and the, the couch. The, the received dose will be 1.8 millisievert. 
And this is the last presentation I'm going to introduce, which is by uh, Xiao Bing and his uh, colleague. And the title is Application of Radiation Protection System in Advanced Particle Therapy. And they mentioned that recently awareness of radiation safety and ethics that dimension of reasonable bonus to radiation protection in medicine has been re improved. So they do this research to introduce the application of ICRP radiation protection system in Shanghai Proton and Harvey Ion Center and the Shanghai Ruqing Hospital Proton Center from the aspect of design, construction, licensing procedure, both for equipment registration and radiation safety facility radiation safety operation and administration controls. And they found that there are some over conservative in the design construction and the operation of other the symmetric facility were observed compared with other facility. And let's over it. I hope you take some time to check the poster even on the next room or online. Thanks. Thank you very much, and uh, I apologize that the order, we changed the order. In a way, we, we introduced two talks and then the rapid war and this one, so I'm sorry. So now it's, it gives me great pleasure to in, um, welcome Dr. Claudia Roubaix. She's a radiation oncologist at Saarland University, Germany. She's also a member of the ICRP Committee 3, and she's going to present her research uh, on this following. Thank you for your kind introduction and for the opportunity to present the experimental data of our lab. So carbon ion, uh, um, ionizing radiation has a favorable dose distribution with a higher linear energy transfer and an increased relative biological effectiveness compared to photon-based radiotherapy. And here you can see the relative dose curves for the different types of radiation. And you can see for carbon ions, the green line, you have a low entrance and a low exit dose. And uh, the ma majority of energy is deposited here in the Bragg peak, which can be targeted to the tumor. Um, low LET irradiation is supposed to induce isolated DNA lesion in the whole nucleus, but high LT irradiation is supposed to induce cluster DNA damage along particle tracks. And we aimed in our projects to characterize this DNA damage pattern in cultured fibroblast following high LT irradiation with carbon ion versus low LT irradiation with photons. So DNA double strand breaks are the most deleterious DNA lesions and non-homologous end joining is a major pathway in mammalian non-proliferating cells to repair double strand breaks. And central to this process is the initial detection of DSPs by the Q70, Q80 heterodimer, keeping broken DNA ends in close proximity until rejoining and also recruiting DNA PKCS. So we used these activated, that means phosphorylated forms of Q70, Q80, DNA PKCS as a marker for actively processed double strand breaks. While 53BP1, or also gamma H2X, uh, marks only heterochromatin-associated DNA lesions. So here our workflow. Um, we used high LT irradiation versus low LT irradiation to irradiate fibroblast in cell culture, and then we characterize the DNA damage pattern by immune fluorescence and transmission electron microscopy. And for this, these approaches, we use the same primary antibody, but um, instead of the fluorophore labeled secondary antibody used by, for IFM, we used immunogold beads um, for TEM. And you can see here, using IFM, we can show the Fluorophore labeled DNA repair proteins in DAPI labeled uh, stained nuclei. You can see here for 53PP1 the radiation induced foci, but for Q70 um, you can't detect any foci because um, after lower LT irradiation, the, um, there are 
the concentration of these molecules is too low to give a signal. But here for using TEM, we can visualize the gold label DNA repair proteins in the chromatin ultrastructure. You can see here the whole nucleus. This is the nucleolus, and the light electrolucent regions are euchromatin, and the more electrodense regions are heterochromatin. And this marked region is shown at higher magnification here. And you can see already here the gold beads. Um, and we used the 10 nanometer gold beads for Q70, now pseudocolored in red, and the, C, uh, the 6 nanometer gold beads for 53 BP1. So first we characterized the DNA damage pattern after lower deterioration, and we can um, detect the isolated DNA lesions in the whole nucleus using the marker PQ70. We can detect the unrepaired double strand break here in the electrolucent euchromatin, like here, and um, also in the electrodense heterochromatin, like here, here together with 53 BP1. So when we analyze DSB repair kinetics by quantifying Q70 dimers in euchromatin and heterochromatin at different time points, we can show that euchromatic double strand breaks, here the red curve, are sensed and repaired rapidly. Almost 80% of the double strand breaks were repaired within 40 minutes. But heterochromatic double strand breaks are repaired with clearly slower kinetics. Here's a green line. But nearly all double strand breaks are efficiently repaired after low LET radiation within 24 hours. We then characterize the DNA damage pattern after high LET radiation with carbon ions using a transverse beam direction. And using IFM, you can see here the particle track visualized by 53 BP1. And here you see the overview um, for TEM of the whole cell. And you can see already here, see the decondensation of the chromatin. And when we pseudocolor and extend these gold beads based on cluster size, we can see this, this, um, this pattern of DNA damage with multiple DNA lesions uh, along the particle track. And when we more extend these lesions, we can see that 53 BP1 marks the whole track, but the actively processed double strand breaks are always detectable at the euchromatic, heterochromatic borders within the track area. So then we analyzed highly T radiation um, carbon ions with a vertical beam direction. Then we can observe by IFM these clustered foci. We observe only very small co-localizing foci for Q70 and Q80, but much larger clustered foci for 53 BP1. And these um, foci even increased with time from half an hour to five hours. And here, the quantification of the number of foci with the maximum at half an hour after exposure, and here, the measurement of the area of these clustered foci, where we can see there's an increase up to five hours after radiation exposure. And here now, um, the TEM analysis, already in the overview of these cell nuclei, you can see these decondensed chromatin regions, DCR. This is the light electrolucent areas here in the chromatin. And when we perform immunogold labeling, we can see that um, for Q70 and Q80, that these actively um, processed double strand breaks are at the border of these DCRs, while 53 BP1 here in green is um, detectable in heterochromatin associated regions. So we then quantified the um, the Q7, Q80 and DNA PKCS nanoparticles half an hour and five hours following low LET versus high LET irradiation. And we can see that following low LET irradiation, we have a decrease of Q, um, Q70 
Q80 and DNA PKCS nanoparticles here, indicating an efficient DSB repair. But then we analyzed, quantified the nanoparticle following low LET irradiation, and we observed an increase for Q80 and DNA PKCX nanoparticles in total, not in euchromatine, but in heterochromatine. And this means that there's a delay in the detect detection of double spin breaks clustered in heterochromatic compartments. And there is first um, chromatine remodeling um, important so that the DSP can be detected. We also analyze the clustering of double strand breaks within particle tracks, and we have um, divided different size categories, one to two, three to four, and more than four nanoparticles, and everything more than two nanoparticles for phosphorylated Q70, Q80, or DNA PKCS, in short, arranged in short distance, is a cluster of more than two double strand breaks. So, we can show that highly 3D induces more clustered double strand breaks, particularly in the heterochromatic regions, shown here. And these clustered DNA damage even increased with time. So there is an increase from half an hour to um, five hours. So we presume that DSB clustering and heterochromatine following high LT irradiation may perturb efficient DNA repair. So currently we have established an automated image analysis of 10 micrographs using the HALO image analyze platform from Indica Labs. And by this software we can um, define the chromatine density in the area of DCRs based on the electron density. Um, we can also detect um, not only the DCR, but also the nanoparticle in the area of DCRs, so that the nanoparticles of different size were automatically recognized, localized, and quantified. And we can show, again, with this approach, there's a time-dependent enlargement of these DCRs, and there's a time-dependent redistribution of the nanoparticles in relation to the DCR border regions. And in general, we have, a, together with this DCR enlargement, we have a relative displacement of nanoparticle from the outside at half an hour after irradiation exposure. And then at five hours, um, we have the maximum in the border region. So we presume chromatine within particle track areas progressively progressively opened to permit the repair of cluster DNA damage. So this is again on the, our workflow for automated image analysis of 10 micrographs with the automated quantification of nanoparticles in different chromatine compartments. We can define the, den the, the density of nanoparticles um, to analyze the clustering of DSPs and we can um, automatically, automatically uh, characterize um, the radiation-induced DNA damage pattern at the nanometer scale. So in conclusion, high LT irradiation induces clustered DNA lesions within particle tracks with multiple closely spaced double strand breaks in heterochromatine. These clustered lesions are repaired with clearly slower kinetics and a large fraction remains unrepaired these unrepaired or misrepaired DNA lesions are associated with increased cell death and genomic instability and explain the higher biological effectivity of high LT irradiation. And RE-based automatic image analysis permits the evaluation of DNA damage pattern following exposure to different radiation qualities. And DNA damage patterns impact the RBE and thus is an important topic for radiation protection. At the end, I would like to acknowledge the financial support, especially from the BMBF, and I would like to thank you for your attention. So we have time for one question for the speaker. 
Dr. Gail. Thank you, Gail Wallace, Jack from uh, USA. Um, I really like your work. One of the problems that comes up with nanoparticles, there are two problems actually. Number one is that they, cl they tend to clump together. Um, so are you sure you're not getting clumping? And the second question is, could the electrons from the TEM be activating the nanoparticles to release OJ electrons so you're getting more local damage? Sorry, can you repeat the first question? <laughs> I'm sorry. For, first question is, have you checked to make sure you're not getting clustering of your nanoparticles? They tend to clump together. Clustering of what? We just, use, uh, we just analyzed double strand breaks. We used markers, um, DNA repair markers. From but you're also looking at the nanoparticles, right? It's a na nanoparticles she's talking about. Nanoparticles. I mean, nanoparticles. Yeah. I mean, this is just the immunogold beads of our technique. Right, but they, but they tend to clump together. So could you be counting nanoparticles inappropriately because you have so many clumped together? Yes, um, because of this high, um, yes, we, we can really look at the nanoscale. So we just um, really can uh, count all the nanoparticles. Okay, we, mean, we, yes, will, just... we will talk later. Thank you. <laughs> and, uh, I don't want to take mean, more time. Yeah. Perhaps technical, some te technical questions to be uh, clarified. I mean, we have very thin sections of uh, 70 nanometers, and we perform the staining, um, and then we can really detect all the single nanoparticles, all the gold beads. Thank you. <laughs> can I ask one question, Dr. Claudia? The question is, um, um, you have tested with fibroblast cells. Um, if you have you tested a culture with mixed cells, both the normal and fibroblast, and have you seen a pattern of damage the normal cells? Because I'm interested in the radiation protection of the normal cells. I mean, it's a good question, but we um, we just started with um, cultured fibroblast only fibroblast. I mean, sure. We can also detect, of course, these. Um, we can use these techniques also for tissues. That's no problem. Yeah. But we have never co-cultured with um, other cells until now. Thank you. Thank you. So the the next talk is. <laughs> so I'd, I'd like to welcome uh, Dr. Takshuhito Sato. Yeah. Dr. Hiko Sato. Yes, <laughs> thank you. And uh, he's, he's from Japan, he's going to talk, and he's from the IAE of the Japan, and he's going to present the following. Okay, so uh, thank you for interaction. So today I would like to talk about the RV for ion beams and their target alpha therapy from the medical physics to radiological protection. So, uh, the RV is a common keyword of both modality. So, I would like to talk about the fundamentals of RV at the beginning. Then, I would like to introduce our recent RV studies applying medical physics to radiological protection. So, the definition of RV, I think most of you know the ratio of the absorbed dose to give the some biological effect by the reference radiation, such as photon, to test radiation. So, it depends on radiation type, dose and dose rate, and biological endpoint complicatedly. Uh, in general, uh, RV is higher for high LET particles, higher at the low dose and dose rate, and higher for stochastic effects than tissue reaction. And the role of the RV in the design of TAT and uh, ion beam therapy is uh, it is weighted on the absorbed dose to estimate the therapeutic and harmful effect in comparison to X-ray. And this weighted dose is occasionally called RV weighted dose, photon ice effective dose, equi effective dose, biological dose, or whatever. So it's quite a lot of term, but uh, there are slightly the definition is different, but the fundamental is the same. So uh, the precise evaluation of RV is indispensable in their treatment planning. So next question is how to determine RV for TAT and ion beam therapy? For TAT, 
uh, as uh, Watterson slightly explained, a uh, fixed value of five is recommended to use based on the expert judgment by reviewing experimental literature. But recent ICRU reports suggest to consider the dose and dose rate dependence of RV by introducing the concept of biologically effective dose or equi-effective dose. They are based on the LQ model and the decrease of the beta term for high LET and low dose rate radiation can be considered. So it's good for the estimate the therapeutic effect of TAT. For ion beam therapy, uh, RV is estimated from the microdosmetric model, such as microdosmetric kinetic model, MKM, and local effect model, LEM. And uh, in the model, the complicated dependence of RV on particle charge, energy, and dose are considered. And the model parameters are mostly evaluated from the measured surviving fractions. So, owing to the widespread of ion beam therapy and TAT, uh, many studies have been performed to evaluate RV for medical purpose, and the accuracy in the evaluation has been greatly improved in the last decade. So, to confirm my impression, I searched the number of publications per year uh, using PubMed with the keyword of RB plus medical or RB plus protection. So up to 2010, the numbers are quite similar, but uh, after 2010, the RB plus medical keyword dramatically increased, while the RB plus protection still increased, but uh, the range of increase is not that much. So we can say that RV is a hot topic in medical physics, but RV stay calm uh, in the radiological protection. So I would like to activate this term more in the radiological protection. So uh, what kind of RV studies are required for radiological protection now? So to answer this question, I would like to show the same slide I showed two days ago. So in ICRU report 95, uh, it suggests that uh, limits to prevent damage to lens of eye and local skin should be set in the absorbed dose rather than the equivalent dose, because that we are used in the calculation of the equivalent dose related to stochastic effect rather than the tissue reaction. And the RV weighting of absorbed dose in relation to specific health effect could be applied for the protection and operational quantity as appropriate. But the RV for preventing tissue reactions has not been proposed, neither ICRP or ICRU. And including this issue, uh, ICRP recently uh, launched a new task group named uh, RV quality factor and radiation weighting factor. And the objectives of this task group is uh, review the determination of RV and especially the derivative value Q and WR and provide the support or lack of support for particular values, models, and determination that influence the radiological protection. And the proposed approaches for modification in these values will be considered. So I'm a member of this task group, and uh, uh, as a part of this activity, I apply the recent apply, uh, uh, RV study dedicated to medical physics to radiological protection. So next, I would like to introduce our recent study. So this is the outline of our study. So first, uh, we need to decide the biological endpoint, and we selected skin reactions because skin reaction is important for both medical physics and radiological protections. And uh, we selected uh, uh, microdosmetric kinetic model, MKM, which is used in the treatment planning of carbon ion therapy in NIRS now. 
And the procedures are first, uh, we review the past in vivo experimental data of RB for skin reactions and found 23 articles. Then uh, we simplified it uh, MKM by reducing its free parameter to one and evaluate its best fit value to each experiment. And finally, we calculated RV for monoenergetic neutron irradiation using the simplified MKM coupled with the evaluated parameter and compare the data with WR value. So, uh, I will talk about the uh, detail of the last uh, three steps. And first, I will talk about the cell of MKM. So, uh, basic assumption of the MKM is a cell nucleus can be divided into several sub-regions uh, called domains, like this. And the two types of DNA damage, named lethal and sub-lethal regions, are induced in the cell nucleus due to the radiation exposure. So red one is a lethal and blue one is a sub-lethal region in this case. And the initial number of DNA damage produced in a domain are proportional to the specific energy of the domain, but it's saturated at certain specific energy. So basically, specific energy is a microdosimetric quantity of dose. So basically, the number of DNA damage is uh, proportional to the dose around that area. So that's the assumption. And uh, a sub lethal region is to be repaired or converted in the lethal region via spontaneous transformation or interaction with another sub lethal region are produced in the same domain. Then a domain is considered to be dead when a lethal region is formed in a site. And a cell is considered to be dead when a domain in its nucleus has died. So it is very classical but very simple uh, model for explaining, expressing the survival fraction. And based on this, as these assumptions, uh, we can uh, mathematically derive the LQ relationship of the cell survival fraction uh, with the uh, only one quantity for characterizing radiation fields, that is saturation collected specific energy calculated from the uh, probability density of linear energy in domain. And uh, in this equation, uh, fundamental uh, alpha beta parameter on fundamental radiations and the saturation collected parameter Y0 and the size of the domain, domain radius, are the free parameter independent of radiation field. And uh, we introduced two new assumptions to simplify the model. First one is the saturation parameter Y0 is always equal to 100 kV per micron because this is quite common value for expressing the cell survival. And the uh, alpha beta ratio for skin reaction is fixed to 10 gray for X-ray therapy radiation field uh, based on the ICRP 118. Then beta and uh, RD becomes the only parameter for calculating surviving fractions. And considering that the surviving fraction for both test and uh, reference radiation and proportional to beta, uh, domain radius becomes the only remaining parameter for calculating RV. So we evaluated the best fit uh, domain radius for each measurement, each 23 measurement, by reproducing the experimental setup in fits. Uh, actually, this is the most difficult part of this study because uh, I have to look up very old papers, 70s, uh, 80s, and I need to uh, figure out the experimental conditions. So, but this is uh, rather too specific, so I would like to speak, skip all that part, and uh, show the, I'd like to show the result. And uh, this table shows the experimental conditions and the evaluated uh, domain radius 
for each experiment. And uh, I'm sorry for this slide, but uh, the important things I can say from this table is uh, mean and standard deviation of domain rate is 0.187 plus minus 0.043 microns. So this, with this number coupled with the uh, FITS code, we can estimate the RV for skin reaction for any irradiation conditions with uncertainties. So I would like to show some uh, comparison with experiment. Uh, this is the RV as a function of dose for carbon 290 MeV SOVP or uh, neutron barium neutron source. And uh, uh, as you see, uh, the center line is the uh, RV estimated uh, from the uh, middle of the uh, uh, mean uh, domain radius while uncertainties are RV estimated by setting their domain radius to mean plus minus one sigma value. So we can expect that 67% uh, of the experimental data could be lie within the uh, data, uh, within the uncertainty. And the calculation can reproduce the experimental trend, including the uh, dose dependence quite well, and the most experimental data uh, lie within the uncertainty. Of course, some of them are outside of the data because uh, uncertainty is for one sigma. And finally, this is, I think, most important slide I would like to show here. The calculate RV for monoenergetic neutron in comparison to the WR value. So this is neutron energies, and the green one is the RV maximum. It's a limit of dose equal to zero. And the orange line is RV at the 10 gray. And we selected cobalt 60 as a reference radiation in this calculation. And as expected, RVE is generally lower than the WR value except for the low dose and the low energy neutron irradiation here. Actually, this trend is specific to skin reactions because most skin dose for low energy neutron irradiations come from uh, nitrogen capture, uh, protons generated by nitrogen capture reaction. While most other dose uh, come from the gamma rays uh, from the hydrogen capture reactions. So WR is uh, for like a human body uh, data to represent a human body. So uh, it's natural to set the lower value, but uh, only if you consider only about the skin reaction, the data is rather high, even for low energy neutron irradiation. So care should be taken in the treatment of thermal neutron in determining the RV factor applied to uh, skin reaction. Let me summarize my talk. So precise evaluation of RV is indispensable in the design of TAT and ion beam therapy. And the accuracy in evaluations has been greatly improved owing to the recent RV study dedicated to medical physics. And RV factor used for tissue reactions must be determined before the next ICRP recommendations. And the microdosimetric model established for medical application can be contributed to providing the scientific background in the determination of RV factor. Of course, I don't want to say that my calculated RV can be directly used for the RV factor for radiology protection. So we must think many uh, other issues, like a simplification, so, but uh, definitely we need to provide more scientific background in the next publication, in different from the previous, like a WR determination or QR determination, as I talked uh, two days ago. So lastly, I would like to uh, thanks to my collaborator, Matsuya-san and Hamada-san. And if you are interested in our model, so please check uh, this paper uh, published a year ago. 
That's all, and thank you very much for attention. So, no, thank you. You want to take a seat so we can start the opening? Okay. So the session is now open for discussion. Without any questions, without any questions, if nobody asks any questions, we're not going to let you out for a coffee break. So please ask questions. Yes. Yeah, it's not so much a question, more a comment um, about the presentation on the neutron dose rates around the particle therapy. So it's very interesting and it's, and it's important and it's, it's nice to see that it's measured in detail and taken into account angular and all these things. So I would also like to point you to the fact that within Eurodos we have also done a lot of measurements. So it would be nice to compare your results with what was done in uh, Eurodos because there were measurements done in several uh, proton centers. Thank you. May I kindly ask who are asking the question to tell their name and what are the, how are they affiliated to? So, so I'm Philip van Haver from Belgian Nuclear Research Center and chairperson of Eurodos. So that's why I ask. Please. Uh, uh, thank you very much for nice talk. I, uh, I'm Yoshi Matsumoto from Tokyo Tech Japan, and I have a particular question to the last speaker, Dr. Sato. Uh, so uh, your study have a beautifully obtained uh, uh, and, uh, dimension of the micro, uh, mi micro domain that converges at around 0 0.187 micrometer. So my question is, what do you think is the biological meaning of this site? And what's the uh, uh, meaning of the sub lisa damage and uh, lisa damage? Okay, thank you. It's a very frequently asked questions for MKM. And uh, of course, that this is my opinion. So there's no like a, MKM itself is a, like a mathematical model. So there's no like a specific definition. But my opinion, the domain is uh, so DNA can move around, but there, like a this is a cell, and if the DNA is here, so this DNA cannot be moved to here. So this DNA can move only around here and interact with the DNA in a certain area. So domain represents that area. And I think it's quite reasonable. 0.5 micron is quite reasonable, slightly smaller than the chromatin domain. So I think it's quite reasonable. And the, the next question is, uh, what is a lethal and sub lethal region? So this is also, Matsuya-san also studied on this topic quite well. And uh, our conclusion is uh, lethal region is a complex DNA damage. So once it's created, it's almost impossible to repair, like a two DNA, a double strand break with some other like a base damage. And the sub lethal region is basically simple double strand break, mostly repaired, but uh, sometimes misrepaired. Thank you. Please, sir. Uh, I'm a biologist. <laughs> and then biologist uh, is thinking probably things uh, from different direction. And co current uh, tissue weighting factor is, I mean, relation weighting factor, I'm so, so, yes. uh, comes from like two, from maybe originally uh, two direction, killing uh, as a marker and carcinogenesis, and maybe three markers. Uh, killing would be the one big marker and it because maybe till 1950 to 1960, 70, Cell killing was a good marker with uh, tissue culture cells. And so then sublethal and the lethal damage concept came, uh, yes. depending on the repair kinetics. Yes. And uh, then uh, geneticist comes up with a kind of RVE dependent on the marker. This is also not really precise marker at all because uh, like I mean color of uh, flower or whatever it is and uh, but when it goes down to the molecules uh, maybe 
dimension, then you may have sim si si one mutation might be due to uh, point mutation or deletion or whatever it is. So different kind of you know, damage and repair uh, is ending up mutation of uh, petal color, but it might be point mutation, a deletion or whatever. So it's a very kind of, you know, so RBE is very much dependent on the uh, real biomarker and tissue reaction is clinical marker. <coughs> and so nobody exactly knows you know, what is the real mechanism for this tissue reaction, like lymphocyte must be involved, and uh, some uh, maybe cytokine will be released from the cells, and uh, this lymphocyte comes up and make inflammation. So I think, you know, dependent on probably uh, original real event at the molecular uh, level, probably might be ending up different uh, so-called biomarker. And I think uh, me, sir? It, it's a role of may, ICR. So may I, may I, I interrupt? Um, do you have a question specific? Because we yeah. don't have So many. I think, you know, RBE has to be defined more pre scientifically, probably by ICRU people or ICLP people. But it's very complex one. So uh, you might be using uh, kind of more like conventional RBE, but it's about time for maybe radiation scientists to, to think about uh, real background mechanisms of uh, all of these, you know, different biomarkers. That's my comment. Sorry. Thank, Thank you. you. So I, I, I have like a one, one opinions on that. So definitely, so we discussed with Hamada-san and uh, Hamada said he's a good biologist and uh, the appropriateness of using cell survival, RV, to represent the uh, skin reaction, like a tissue reaction, RV. So we analyze the cell survival, RV, and uh, skin reaction, RV, using the same model. And we got a significant difference between them. So RV for skin reaction is rather high. So that's also given in our paper, but I, it's a little bit uh, too much uh, in detail, so I didn't uh, talk in this presentation. But uh, yeah, I do agree with that uh, we cannot simply use the cell survival RV for tissue reaction. That's definitely, I do agree. So it's more like complicated pathway to the, uh, yeah, so. That's all, but one good thing of our model is uh, we can consider that part into the model. So, of course, it's lots of simplification, but at least we determine the parameter based on skin reaction. That means uh, RV should be the skin reaction. So, mechanism is, we are not sure, but still, the model represents the skin reaction. That's a very important point, and thank you very much. Thank you very much. I would like to encourage uh, asking very specific question. Uh, to, I'm sorry, to accommodate more questions, uh, specific questions so we can ask more questions. So my question is uh, again about the uh, identity of the domain, so-called domain in the MKM model. And uh, from uh, the biological, uh, biologist point of view, it's very, uh, I think it's very similar to uh, what we call uh, topologically associated domain. Uh, which is a uh, region of DNA targeted by a molecule called cohesin. So I want to ask uh, Claudia uh, about uh, the possibility of uh, possibility of uh, assessing uh, the number of double strand breaks in a one uh, DNA loop in the uh, topologically associated domain uh, by using your uh, method. I don't know, work? <laughs> okay, um, I mean, we are able to really uh, identify, detect, localize, and quantify D 
DNA double strand breaks or single strand breaks in the whole nucleus, but we have never tried to identify the DNA loops. I mean, we have the problem when we perform um, electron microscopy, we have very thin sections of uh, 70 nanometers. So we have just one very small thin section of the whole nucleus. So to identify the loops, I think, uh, I don't know if there are special markers or it's of course in the three dimension. So it's much more complicated. So there are new approaches with uh, electron microscopy and we are working on this, but at the moment we are not able to identify these DNA loops. All right, thank you. Yes, sir. I'm impressed with this uh, targeted alpha therapy that gave. Yeah. And uh, there, there, I think, very important is the, med the, the development of the medicine. The medicine should concentrate on the cancer. It should not go to the no normal part. And uh, so far, I heard the thyroid cancer, uh, the medicine for the thyroid cancer. Uh, and are there, there should be many other uh, cancers. And uh, I, are you sure that you can develop good medicines so that they concentrate on the targeted uh, cancers? Thank you. So thank you very much for your question. So the, uh, yeah, we need to think about the, uh, cancer specificity or uh, high accumulation in the target. Uh, but in the normal organ, there's some variability in the radiation uh, sensitivity or re reaction to the physiological accumulation. So in some organ, it's, it can tolerate to some degree. So uh, we need to think about the uh, sensitivity. And yeah, and I think we can achieve uh, the uh, good medicine, good radiopharmaceutical uh, or uh, target therapy uh, in the future. Yeah. When can you start really the, the treatment of people with this method? When? <laughs> in so you, two you, years, in three years, you can really start treating the patient with this method? I, you mean for multiple cancer? Yeah. yeah uh, any, any cancer? Any, any any cancer. Uh, yeah. yeah, we are now developing uh, that kind of uh, radiopharmaceutical rubber by astatine. So Absolutely. maybe in four or five years, we, yeah, we can it's start. It's very nice. That's why I'm asking this. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Anybody else? Um, I have a question for uh, uh, Dr. Yona Ai. The question is, why is neutron dose lower with scanning beam versus the broad beam? It's already on. Yeah, no, no. I, I talked in my presentation that the broad beam method has a, a needs a many interaction uh, irradiation devices. So the um, carbon beam uh, should pass through the irradiation devices. At that, at that time, uh, neutrons, secondary neutrons are produced in, in, in the irradiation devices. So, but but uh, on the other hand, the, the beam uh, scanning method does not need the uh, irradiation devices uh, such as collimators. So, so uh, neutrons is less. Thank you. One final question for Dr. Um, um, Sato. So you mentioned that um, RBE is hot in medical physics. RBE is calm in uh, radiation protection. What do you mean by that? Does it mean that we are all solved in terms of radiation protection? No, you, you are one of the slides you mentioned. Right now, there are a lot of papers in medical physics about RBE. Yes. And there are very few papers in radiation protection. Yes. Does it mean that we have solved the problem for radiation protection or there are, people are not doing it? <laughs> it's hard, very hard to answer, so yeah. Maybe, uh, of course, the RV study for radiological protection is also still going, but the medical number of the medical application is dramatically increased. So that's because of the widespread of ion beam therapy and the TAT. So, but uh, maybe the radiological protection issue is still the same, so we still have a lot of things to do, but uh, it's not like a hot topic, so we need to handle like a RNT issue or maybe other issues we have a lot. So maybe so just one part of the 
uh, study. So that's thank, my opinion. Thank you very much. I think we are, um, we want to close the session and thank you very much. And I'd like to like. Yeah. Okay, thank you so much. So give great applause to four uh, splendid uh, presenters. Thank you. Thank you for attending this session.